Hello, welcome to the All or Not podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. This is a Northwest based courier company delivering all across the UK. They can assist in home moves and removals to large, heavy, and bulky items, collections, and drop offs. Fast, safe, and reliable deliveries. Please get in touch for a free quote. You'll find all the information within the description. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome to the All or Nothing podcast and today's special guest is Peter Machalis. How are you Peter? Very fantastic. Brilliant. What a story, what a story this fella's got, what a story. I was reading about you this morning just to, to recap. Um, I've, I've been reading about you last week and I watched a movie on you. Oh brilliant. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. But this is your podcast, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get slaughtered. So Peter... Tell us a little bit about your early life. My early life, I was uh, born in Glasgow. Um, we it came the end of the war and we didn't have any housing, so my grandfather went away at a part of Glasgow next to Berlin Prison and he found a, an empty block, a, a tenement block, and we just moved into it. We squatted in it. And uh, before we knew where it was, the place was full and there was what, one... There was 12 houses there and there were 60 kids in the 12 mm-hmm. houses. And uh, it was fun. You know, people going about the slums, hard background, everything. Do you know something that was terrific? Yeah. You know, we were, we were playing all the time. We were always having games. Uh, the men get drunk, fought with each other, you know, which was natural in that time. Yeah. Um, I I actually enjoyed it. And at times my dad got himself locked up in Berlin. Uh, because he was an absent without leave from the army and he uh, they put him in a cell where he could see her house and my mother you know she was a real jock woman yeah how oh, Peter gonna go and see how your dad's doing there and he'd put things in the window you know, <laughs> different colors in the window of his cell <laughs> to let her know that he, he loved her or he you know just um, or he was depressed you know and she she'd work off that and uh he then came out of jail and uh, tended to beat me up for the next ten years of my life. No, it was it was it was he didn't know any better. He'd been in, he'd joined the army. He'd been in army jails all the time. You know, it was just strictness. I'm not. He, he just wasn't cut out for it. Yeah. I mean, I had to. He, he he was in jail so much during the war that I just heard about him. I never <laughs> saw him. It's mad, that, isn't and, it? And. I went to my auntie's one day and there was a soldier and I, I said, hey, mister, are you my daddy? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I looked at him and I didn't know him. And uh, then he came into my life. He, he, he finished up, he got discharged out of the army. Mm. But in those days uh, in the army, if you joined in 39, you were out and you came out in 45. If you joined in 40, you came out in the... Uh, 46, 47 and so on and so on until National Service began because yeah. we were trying to get that off, off the ground. My dad came out in 1952 <laughs> because he had to pay all his jail time back and it didn't go down too well with him. Um, he must have been about 10 at this age as well. It was, yeah, it was... Just a young young boy. I was only a young boy and I, you know, I, it was always, he was always immaculate. You know, everything was spotless for him. Um, and it was through being in military prisons, you know, mm-hmm. everything had to be in its place. Um, and then he, he got locked up and they discharged him from the army. And uh, he went out to work and he got various jobs in the building sites. Uh, but he never stuck anything for too long. He was moving, always moving on, you know. Um, and he was very strict with us, you know. But he, he was, there was also a funny side to him, you know, you, like, I look at it now, and we, we lived in this house, I mean, there was a slum, you know, and, and the great thing about Glasgow, this is why I'm proud of Glasgow, our slums are the best, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
he said, Cathy, I'm going to paint this house. And he, he got a job in the dockyards. He said, I'll bring some paint home to come home. And it was Battleship Grey. Yeah. And what he'd got, he'd got some of this uh, yellow paint, you know, the safety paint for the steps. Yeah. So you could see the, the, the steps were there. And he painted the, the wall grey. And then he had a four inch paintbrush and he went round the edge of it with his yellow paint. And the probation officer, I was on probation at the time, came to see me. He said, I see your dad's been decorating again. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a set of goalposts, you know. Yeah. In his own way, he tried, you know. Yeah. Um, he was just, he was an awkward and a difficult character. Extremely, he was, a, he was hard, he was tough. Um, and he started this pitch and toss school. You know, and uh, somebody came to try and dethrone him and take his pitch in tour school. So the, uh, this guy comes from the other side of the city. He opens his jacket and there's a gun in there. You know, and Kiter, Kiter which was my dad's nickname, opened his cell up like I had two guns because he knew the guy was coming. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he finished, he finished up in jail again. Um, I think me and my brother had caused it. We went playing cowboys and Indians with a gun. The, <laughs> the real coppers, one. And the coppers came along, where did you get that, son? It's my daddy's. <laughs> so he, he got locked up and that that was him. He finished, he just had enough. Yeah, you know, he, he, he started to settle down in his own way, plus the fact um, we were starting to get older. And I couldn't wait to get away from home. It, was, it, it wasn't nice, you know. Yeah. He was locked up all the time. Um, you know, my mother would say, so sort of Bellini prison was there. Uh, our house was just 400 yards from the prison. And there was a big spud field there. It belonged to the prison for feeding the prisoners. And my mother would say, Peter, you better get spuds. We were all starving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I used to go and get some spuds. And then everybody else in the block twigged onto it. And before we were finished, half a field of spuds had gone, you know. And the, the warders then sort of barred it off, you know, at a gate. It was, see, but it, what, when you hear these, some of these movie stars speaking, when I was in the slums, so and so, you know, and you get this heartache and it was fucking terrific. You know, yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the people there, we all helped each other out. Um, you know, there was... It was just the way they were. Yeah, you took me back myself yeah. to when I was, I mean, I was a kid of the 70s growing yeah. up. You know, it was a lot. It was a little, yeah. bit, little bit after your time, but at, yeah. at the same, there was no, there was none of this, there was no temptations that yeah. we have today, these kids, and you're not locked in your room on, on an Xbox and playing on these games. Yeah. It was like you were outside and, you know, and you made yeah. the best of what you had and, and they were fun time. So I was smiling to myself as you were talking about that because we lived in, in empty shells of houses and we were no there was no health and safety back then and no. there was no one stopping you from doing what you wanted to do so it was exciting yeah. but at the same time it was quite dangerous anyway when we first went to that slum building as i say it belonged to berlini prison and they got they just came up with a big van and arrested everybody that was in the premises and i was i was only young at the time i'm sitting there's coppers all over locking us up and they took us to court and the judge said have these people got anywhere to live? Can can the the, the, the corporation house them? They said no. He says, "Well, don't ask me to put them on the street." So we stayed there for, we were there for about ten years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we moved on from then. I did a wee bit of boxing. Um, I got involved with that for a bit. Um, I was fairly good. I wouldn't say I was going to make a great. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we moved to a new housing estate called Rukesi. And uh, I started getting interested in the army. But my dad, he kept on all the time. He just kept on and on. You know how we were holding them back in life. And I just, one day I just got up, hitchhiked to Aberdeen and got a job there. By this time I was 16. And I got a wee job working in the docks. And it, it was for a man's job, but they gave it to me because, I, you know, I, I used to work fairly hard and I was fairly fit. 
and uh, I got a job on loading the coal boats. And uh, there's a guy there who used to turn up to work every morning. Now, don't forget, we're working with coal, and uh, he had a sweat rag around his neck when he turned up for work. It was spotless, and his boots were always shining. You know, we're working with coal. So I got to know him, and he'd been an ex RSM in the army. Yeah. And he said, I used to ask him questions about it because I was always obsessed with the parachute regiment. And uh, I, um, he says, it's a must, son. But I'd like to go back to when I get interest in the, my first interest in the parachute regiment. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, it was a, I seen these guys jumping from a balloon. You know, and I went, you know, and they, they had these camouflage jackets. And they, they, they were all sort of well built boys and that. And I, I was obsessed. There was a movie came out called The Red Berry. And I, I watched it, just to watch the parachute scenes. I just kept following it from movie house to movie house. And one day I saw a para walking through Glasgow and his bearing was, f yeah, it was phenomenal. You know, his shoulders back knee yeah. really looked apart. <laughs> the boots all built up. And I just kept following him on, all the time. And he eventually turned around and said, what the fuck are you doing following me for, you know? Uh, and I, as I say, I just, it was, I was obsessed with the parachute regiment. And, uh, I finally, as I say, I, I met the Sarasim in Aberdeen and I joined the army in Aberdeen yeah. in Market Street. And there was none of this, uh, we're going to counsel you and he's got a, a background, I think he needs talking to beforehand and what. There was none of that. I joined the army. <laughs> that was it. And, and Monday morning, I was an order shot on Friday. You yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was really, it was really funny because... I, I got into the parachute regiment depot and everybody was, you know, smart, moving about. I went, this is the life for me, you know. And uh, the corporal came along and he sh showed me how to fold my kit. Now, get a piece of foolscap paper, put it there, that's it. Now, get your kit the same size as that. This is how you fold your shirt. This is how you put this here. Your toothbrush goes there. Your toothpaste goes there. Everything. And uh, don't forget, I'm only, I'm only a kid. I wrote to my mother, I said, the corporal's my best friend. <laughs> you know, and he was saying, you know, come on, lads, that's it. Yeah, Are you okay? Right, good night. Put the lights off and whatnot. Then he said, we're starting to train in, the, in Monday morning. And we're all going, God, it's going to be great. You know, sort of half past five, six o'clock in the morning, the door spun open and a fucking dustbin came down the centre of the floor. And this cobble, who was my best pal, yeah. <laughs> turned into a raving maniac. <laughs> and my mind, he persecuted me for another 10 weeks. You know, but um, what they were doing was turning civilians into soldiers. And if anybody knew how to do it, it was them. Yeah. Um, we then went to the, uh, the parachute school. And... Uh, we got there and we were obsessed with it. You know, the, the food there was phenomenal. It was a, you know, you were treated like, you got a, a knife, uh, a plate to get your food on. We, were, we turned up with a mess tin, can you see it? Yeah. And knives and forks laid on the table. It was phenomenal. And the, the PGIs, the parachute jumping instructors, they were really kind to us, you know. And, uh, and again, it's a, something I, I often say, you know, Joe's probably sick listen to it. Um, you know, we were always, what's it like parachuting? What does it feel like? And he says, son, it's the only time you're ever going to defecate, urinate and ejaculate at the same time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, I came back from the parachute school, and you, know, you started walking sideways then, you know, so as everybody could see your wings. Yeah. Um, and I, I was in the, the barrack room and I looked at the window and there was this guy who looked on ages with the, the average sergeant in the parachute regiment at that time, but he was a trooper. And he's, you know, his skin was like leather. Yeah. And he had a beige berry on. And I couldn't understand it because he was a trooper. And I went, who, who are they guys? She said, well, that's the SAS. So um, I did a bit of time in the battalion and the mortars, which I didn't particularly enjoy. Because I was too young for it. 
Yeah. For the mortar platoon, they were all old soldiers, you know. And uh, I then went to the SES, and I couldn't believe it. You, you went into the kitchen, how many sausages do you want? You know, so and so and so on. And it was all done for you. You collected your plate at the end. I went to the stores. Uh, there's some kit over there. Okay, kid, take it. Well done. Nobody ever roared or shouted at you. You know, you weren't wiping saliva off your face every yeah. time. You <laughs> spoke to an NCO, you know. Yeah. Um, and But the it was a totally different approach to it. It was personal. Um, the, the instructors, once they got everybody sorted out, and they get rid of the dross. They were fantastic to be with. And you learned an awful lot from them just through talking to them. And uh, it was, I, I really enjoyed the SES. And we, and we did the hills. We did marches over the penny fan and whatnot. And I had a terrible gap in, in my training. I was bad at map reading. And... Uh, this guy called Tanky Smith got a hold of me. He says, you're not too good at map reading, are you? I says, well, I'm guessing most of the time. So what he did, he gave me a sketch map. And there was, there was no, all it was was a piece no of grid, paper. No grid, no grid on it. No grid, nothing. And I, I was using the compass all the time, so it taught me to use my compass. And it just all gelled together. Um, the exercises, we then, Went on to continuation training. The exercises were phenomenal. There was a lot of imagination used. Yeah. Um, for example, we parachuted into Sunnybridge, and you know we got to meet an agent. But you know it's it's a Senator Pratt Plat Plateau by then. Yes. Yeah. The name for the exercise, and uh, we get there and we meet an agent, and he says, right, so and so and so and so, you're gonna go, and you'll go to such and such a place. You'll meet an agent who will brief you on what, what's actually got to be done and fill in the final parts of what you've got to do. But you've got to watch yourself. He's drunk. He drinks an awful lot. You know, this is part of the exercise. Yeah. We got there and we had a guy there and he was genuinely drunk. Yeah. You know, we had to pump information out of know, <laughs> And he's... He must have drunk about 30 pints or something, you know. Um, and we worked out from there and the exercise then took us to another part of the country where we met another agent. We had to do a little demolition job. Um, and we finished up, we had to go, go to a safe house. And we went into the safe house and it was like something out of a movie. You know, there was, there was no roof on this. It was an old farmhouse. Yeah. But it still had the rafters. And there was something in the rafters turning around slowly. They'd taken a, a, a dummy and hung it there. This was the agent we were supposed yeah, to meet. Yeah. And he sort of turning around in the moon and there's this shadow, you know. We walked into this building, we nearly shit ourselves, yeah. you know, at <laughs> first sight. Um, and then we went to another safe house and it was just, and I, I tallied it up at the end of it. You know, we'd marched about 80 mile. And it was all, it was so exciting because you were trying to achieve something every time. Yeah. You weren't marching for the sake of marching. Yeah. Um, there was a goal at the end of it. Oh, yeah. And I actually then went to D Squadron. And uh, I, um, a guy called Ron Eddy, who later died, came and helped me over with my kit. It was, it was terrific. You know, and the, the whole attitude was there. But I, I was still a bit immature. You know, it was, um, and I had this Glasgow attitude, you know. Partially... I think I got off my dad and, you know, just let them have it, you know. And uh, I was doing more than my share of fighting. And I got into a fight with a couple and uh, I got RTU'd back to the Paris. Um, and the great, th you know, the great thing about the SAS, even when they were putting me out of the unit and sending me back to the parachute regiment, nobody ever shouted at me. No. <laughs> no they just said, off you go, come back in a couple of years. And I went back to the parachute regiment, and I was ready for it. I, really, I, I always enjoyed the Paris, you know. Um, I just wanted to be in the what was the so the elite, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I became a section commander. I then 
done my two years, I went back to the SAS and by this time we're in Borneo, Aden, you know, it, it, we were scrapping all the time. And uh, Bor but Mo Borneo was mainly uh, reconnaissance. So we went to Aden and uh, I was an Arabic speaker, so I, I got landed by a couple of trips there. And uh, we we get kitted up one night and we went out to, on this patrol and we climbed a, a mountain called the Jebel Barash, went over the top of it and we went down. And the troop sergeant said to me, Peter, there's a shepherd up front. And I started talking to the shepherd and, and there's certain things I can remember. It was the smell of the guy. It was a, a sweet smell, a scenty smell. And the guy was shouting all the time. I'm saying, be quiet, be quiet. You know, and we said, have you seen any anybody come down here? And uh, and he was shouting and he just pointing and pointing. So we carried on down this wadi and uh, we got there and there was a group of men. Dave Healy came to me again, our, our troop sergeant, and he says, there's some more shepherds there. And I went, five shepherds? Yeah. <laughs> and I went, and I went to speak to him and he shot Dave Healy in the chest. And he stood up, I went, I pumped about five rounds into him and I moved back and a fire fight started and they were really gone for it. They, they, were, they, they, had a, they were already set up. They had a, Prepared yeah, and, for uh, battle. They, they had a, a light machine gun with them and they really ripped into us. And I, I stood back against the wall and something landed in between my legs and I just heard a, a crack. I thought it was like a stone and this crack went off. Anyway, we carried on with the contact. We sorted the situation out. And the next morning I went back to see to where I was because I'd killed my first man. And it wasn't about taking somebody's life. It was about not letting my instructors down. Yeah. You know, being one of the guys, being accepted as one of them, you've done your bit, you know. And I went back and it was a hand grenade line where I'd been standing. And it was an old 36 grenade. And it cracked open and only the detonator had gone off. And uh, thankfully, as I say, I often say, I've, I've got a family now, so yeah. I don't I don't like to think what would have happened if it had gone off, you know? Yeah. Um, it was it was really professional. The guys were good. Um, and we, we carried on in Aden with skirmishes, firefights. Um, and it was funny, but there was one night we came in and I was drinking with one of my mates. We sneaked off to the guards, over to the Coldstream guards, they did a pub there. And we we tended, we, we were off duty so we could get drunk. And then the camp started getting mortared. So we ran outside to the trenches. And I, I tripped over a guy rope in the tent, fell into this trench. <laughs> and it's so, you know, I can cuss myself a little bit, but between that and alcohol, it was, I was combing to his type of thing, you know. Yeah. So I could just hear this guy going, there's a wounded man here, Sarge. And I'm going, I'm okay, I'm okay. And uh, he says, it's, oh, he, there's obviously something wrong. He says, they got me in the stretcher. Ran me into this sort of clinically clean tent. The doctor puts me on the table, you know. Stethoscope round the neck. Quick look. He went, take that man away. He's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just, it just went on like that. that it wasn't all fine. There was funny times and, you know, things, guys were playing tricks in each other. Um, another time, if you told people about it nowadays, professional parachutes, yeah. they'd turn around and say, there's something wrong with these guys. So we we decided we wanted to do, well, not we decided, the troop officer decided that we're going to do an operational jump into a place called Almila to catch this bandit. Muhammad al Maghrabi al Hushabi. He was a real body and we were going to get him. So, <laughs> don't forget, this had never been done before. So, we get ourselves kitted up on the ground. We've got our rucksacks on the whole lot. Sorry. Um, the whole lot. And we're wobbling out, you know, like penguins yeah. out to the, out to the, the uh, helicopters. And we had three helicopters. And Look, we didn't know. It wasn't that we were brave. We were outstanding. It wasn't that we didn't give a shit. We just didn't know. 
So the, the six of us stood on the skids of the helicopters as we were flying in. And the pilots went, go, and we're all falling the same height, you know. <laughs> and normally what you do, you stack your men, you know, sort of bump, bump, bump. Yeah. The bottom one pulls, then the next one pulls. And you come in, but we're all at the same height, we're all different weights. We're, my rucksack came off and I'm spinning round and round and round. I'm, I'm going, think of your discipline. I've really contorted my body. I've been round the other way like that, trying to stop it. And then I said, I better pull. I pulled. I pulled. Sorry. And uh, I looked down and went, one, two, three. I see there's somebody missing. One of the guys had come out of the chopper and he'd pulled as soon as he left, he left the chopper. So we, we get down on the ground and this guy turned in and uh, he said, uh, where's it? we said, where's the shoot? He said, I've put it underneath a bush. And we'd borrowed the shoots off the Americans to do the job, so we had to return them. So we did the, the ambush to try and get this body and we stayed there nearly two days. Nothing happened. So we decided to call it a day. So we got the parachutes and we couldn't find this other one. You know, we were searching on mm. it. took us all day to get it. And we finally got it and, and brought it in. And uh, it was the first operational freefall that was done in the British Army. It was an insertion. It, it wasn't a hot, a hot job where you're jumping into action. Um, that came later in my life and I loved it. Um, the SAS, I always enjoyed being there, but my, 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 my drinking and my behaviour pattern in drink let me down. Yeah. So I went back to the paras again, platform four, you know, sent back to the paras and I, I said, I better get a grip of the situation. So I managed to get myself posted to Brecon. I did the the tactics course at Brecon. I came top of the course and they asked me to come back as an instructor. And I spent my last 18 months instructing at Brecon. It was fantastic, you know. You know, I really learned my trade there. Yeah. Um, I came out of the army. I went to work in oil pipelines, oil rigs, everything. Yeah. And a guy asked me if I wanted to go to Angola, and I went, and I it was a bad experience, in that I got there, and I met a man there who, it takes a lot to make me afraid of another person, because I've always been wanting to take a chance. Yeah. But this guy made me feel very wary. You know, I was sort of on my guard all the time with him. And, uh, and as he was the guy in charge, so I just went, he's, he's the boss, that's it. I never questioned it. He says, right. Now, don't forget, I've come from um, London and I got on the aeroplane as a captain. I emerged at the other side in, uh, in Ndili Airport in Zaire as a major. You know, and talk about accelerated promotion. Yeah. I mean, I've never been a, an officer in my life. But, you know, it's all this mercenary stuff you know um, I got there anyway the, the, what the guy said to me he says could you take eight men down to a place called San Antonio Desire and I got down there and it was it was crazy you know the the people the army was beating up people it was a fishing town um, the electricity had collapsed the hospital had broken down everything was a state of disrepair and I oh, I just, the kit was lying in warehouses all over the place that they needed. So with the guys, you know, I got them and we, we, we started, we got the hospital up and running, got the electricity back on. The town had lights again. Uh, they could start operating again. I got a, a ton of medical kit. There was an old American ship lying out on the bay. I went on there and I found medical kit for Africa. So we, we, we got that sorted out and uh, I then started an MP unit because the soldiers were all out of hand. So I got all the, the heavies out of the, <laughs> out the army yeah. and I made them MPs and they had to control the soldiers because the soldiers were, they were out of control. So everything came right and it was, it, it was looking great down there. 
And one of the guys came and said to me, he says, Peter, thanks for bringing me down here. And he says, you've done the right thing. I says, why? He says, Callum was going to kill you. I says, for what reason? He says, opposition. But I says, I wasn't in opposition to him. You know, I just, I just went out there to get a job. Yeah. Anyway, that happened. And uh, I just carried on doing the job I was doing. And uh, Holden Roberto, who was the president of Northern Angola, came in to see me. He says, I want you to go up and arrest Callan. My heart started going, bubbity bump, bubbity bump, you know. And uh, he says, he's, he's been killing people all over the place. Yeah. So I then, I then flew up to um, Kinshasa, where Holden Roberto was living at the time. And uh, he says, these are going to be your bodyguards. There was some Americans there. Uh, we want you to go and arrest him. I said, yeah. And I walked in and I went, looked at these guys. I was a bit wary because I didn't even know who they were. Most of the guys that I was working with in Angola, I knew them before. And uh, we said, okay, and they, they were there. We flew up to Makella and I seen a vehicle coming to Makella with a, a machine gun on the top of it. I went, and it, I, I could only see figures on it. I couldn't see who was actually on it. My heart was going boom, boom, you know. And uh, I got off the um, the aircraft. I went to walk towards the jeep and my bodyguards had deserted me. You know, I now know how Jesus felt in the Garden yeah. of Gethsemane. I was, <laughs> I was on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Just bailed it. So I went there. Unfortunately, Callan wasn't there. Um... A guy called Sammy Copeland. Anyway, we got um, we get sorted out, and I says, "What's been going on?" I said, "Well, let's let's take you there first. And uh, story start started emerging. Now, Sammy Copeland from the Paris had a fantastic reputation, but he'd fallen under the. Could you take that name out? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he'd fallen under the spell of Callan. And he was into the killing and whatnot. And I said, I heard there's been a massacre. He says, yeah, so a guy came to take me, a driver. And I drove up this re entrant And there was a needy silence. It was like something out of a movie. And he says, it's up here. He says, it's here. I could smell it. I walked in, it was, I think it was 13, 14. Guys lying shot. And I, one guy was lying, he's hand on a bush, and the back of his head had been blown off, and it made an impact on me. I said, how can professional soldiers do this to each other? We're all supposed to be on the same side. So I got back, and uh, it emerged that I'd been involved in all this. And Holden Roberto went, right, let's have a court of inquiry, you know, and we tried to do it as best we could. We brought guys in. And Sammy had definitely been under the infl uh, influence of this guy. And it was just too much for him. You know, he bolted and a guy shot him as he bolted away. And I, I looked at it and I went, this is never right. And I went back to the guys and we looked as, they all looked as if they'd been, like, been in the, like the First World War, you know, black under the eyes, looking into fires. No, not looking anybody in the eye, smoking. I just mean, dead I, in the eye. Yeah, it, yeah. Was just, it was gone. And I said, right, line up. I got him lined up. I said, right, who wants to go back home? Who wants to stay? And they went, oh no, another hatchet man's here. And lucky enough, my cousin was among the group. Yeah. I said, reassure them that I'm, I'm okay. Uh, some of them volunteered to go back. I got them out straight away because all we do is lower them around and the rest. But the funny thing is, a lot of the guys that left were men who were extremely fit, did good backgrounds, and I was left with a couple of kids that had never been in the army, and guys from World War Two, and they says, "Yeah, we'll come." So we we got those guys out, and uh, I was expecting to get supplies and that off the Americans. So I actually spoke to them. Um, 
And I says, are we getting any supplies? I says, Peter, it's finished. I says, why? He says, if we get tied into anything here, the way the behaviour is, it's going to get us a bad name. It's off. So I said, OK. And he says, I'll tell you something else. You're going to get it next. Not not, not me personally, but the group. Yeah. And he says, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got a Portuguese flyer. I'll fly you over the area and you can have a look at it. And it was like some little war movie. I looked down and we were in a town sort of here and there was a big, I counted about 80 armoured vehicles, you know, various types coming up this road and then further up here, it was a like a pincer movement coming in to cut us off. And he said, my advice is get out. So what I did is I, I shot through and I got through the actual pincer and then, lucky enough, I had a demolitions guy with me. He blew up the bridge that they were going to have to cross to close it. So it held them up for a bit. And I I got them all out. And um, it just came to an end there. It was, it was a tragic affair. I, I got back after it. I went to see the, the embassy, spoke to them, and I said, Right, um, uh... I can only give you the names. I tried to do it as, as, as best I could. Yeah. I came back to England and then nothing was going. I sat at home and the soldier had come back into me. I'd had the bug again. I said, I'm going to go to join the Foreign Legion. So I was on the way to join the Foreign Legion and uh, this guy came to me and he said, uh, Peter, he was a friend of mine, a, a reporter. He said, stay away from there. He says, they're not doing anything at the moment. My advice is go to Rhodesia. I says, yeah, OK. And uh, I didn't have enough money. He loaned me some cash to get there. And uh, I flew out to Rhodesia, and I joined the Rhodesian SAS. And now, don't forget, I've been a staff sergeant in the army. And I got made a, a recruit. I had to do five months recruit training and then do an SAS course. Mm. But the funny thing is, I didn't mind it because, you know, I was relearning things that maybe I could have forgot. Yeah. Uh, so I, I actually enjoyed the training. I did the selection. It was a good selection. And uh, I went to the SAS squadron. And the big thing there was, you know, now you're going to see action. And the great thing is, every time you went out, or most times you went out, you had a contact. It was good. And compared with the British Army, you know, you used to say, you're going to Borneo, your heart would go, don't, don't. There you grew comfortable with yeah. that because you were doing it all the time. So the, we did a couple of small parachute insertions into Mozambique, um, ambushes and whatnot. Um, we ambushed one guy there and he'd been wounded in Rhodesia. And his comrades had carried him through into the Mozambique to try and get him looked after. And, you know, they were 10 kilometres away from their camp when we bushwhacked them. You know, it was, it was almost like, you know, the, the poor guy's come all that way yeah. just to get himself <laughs> shot at the end of it. Um, it was there, and then we get called in to the office, or the, the blue room, as we called it. Um, they said, OK, you're, there's an op jump coming off. And they didn't have enough guys for the op jump. It was a Sunday morning, and I, lucky enough, I was in camp. They says, go and, go and get two Dakotas full of men. <laughs> so I'm around the pubs chasing the guys off for this jump, which is going to take place the next morning because it had just come like that. So we we parachuted into a place Kavala, called Kavalamanji in, in Zambia, and we went down and we had, we had firefights there. It, um, but what was there was the stores for all the infantry, in, infiltration that was going to get done into Rhodesia. Yeah. And there was a ton of stores there. So we blow up. Well, that's our intention to blow up. So we set it all up. And the next thing, this lot went up in the air. And th there wasn't a leaf on any of the trees. There wasn't a leaf left. left. It, just, it was bare. The ground was just bare all the way. And I, I looked and I went, this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, we come back from that. And then he says, right, you're in for the big one. You know? So we... Uh, 
we got this fantastic briefing. We were moved back out to New Serum, and this was later on. Um, and we moved to a place called New Serum, and which was we did your parachute training, and there was a big model lay on the floor. I just had a peep, and the guy said, "You're in for it this time." <laughs> this was one of the PGIs. They'd been listening in on the briefing. Yeah. So we got a briefing. It was very clinical, you know, and the the presentation of the briefing was outstanding, you know. Um, you felt as if you were on the ground there. It was that good. And uh, so it says, right, you'll be jumping in tomorrow morning. And we got there, and I've never seen soldiers behave with such a sense of purpose. We were kitting up and everybody was helping each other, you know. And you know, you would just feel that we wanted to go. Yeah. And we, we implained, and what the Rhodesians had done is over this camp that we were going to attack, they'd sent a civilian aircraft about 10 days beforehand and it flew over the camp and it opened its flaps and it made a sort of noise so that people would see it and they were running towards the anti-aircraft guns and it says, oh, it's a civilian aircraft. So the, we, the, the Rhodesians done it for about seven days, eight days and the 10th day, I think it, was, it may have been the 10th, they were looking for the aircraft and six Dakotas came in with paratroopers and <laughs> descended upon them, the messengers of misery, you know. Um, we we were there, there was a, a four DACs, uh, six DACs full of R RLI and uh, an SAS. And we did, a, we, we did a partial envelopment, an airborne envelopment, and then the the RLI came in the other side with helicopters, so we had them boxed. But in case the, 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 there was too much, we left a gap for them there, but that was covered by K cars. Yeah. So on that op, we had Canberra's, we had uh, fleeter aircraft, we had some old uh, vampires, you know, the old jets with the two tails? Yeah. We had some of them, and we had a load of gunships up there. So the, as I say, I jumped out while I was flying in and, you know, and I seen the flight coming up, buff, 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 and the pilots, they just carried on as if you know, nothing was happening. And I, and I stood there and I was number two and I said, Peter, you've been listening to stories like this, like this all your life. Yeah. Now it's your turn. And I went out that door. And I got hung up in a tree and I was trying to break the branches to get down to get my feet. My feet were just barely touching the ground. I broke, trying to break the branches and this guy started firing at me. And he bum, bum, bum. And I, 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 so I hit my cape with all the releases, rolled onto the ground. I got behind an anthill and he was shooting the shit out of the top of the anthill. So I got out my parachute, I got my weapon and uh, there was a guy called Kluzniak. Sorry, no names. Um, on the other side of me, I'll call him the posh jock, and uh, I got up and this guy was firing, I mean, Kluznik was firing from the other side, and I just heard click, and he's, he's, he's been trying to kill me now for the, the past 30 or 40 seconds, and he puts his hands up to surrender, you know, yeah. <laughs> he went blue to rain between the lamps, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, we fought there for a, all that day, we we done a load of ambushing during the night, and it was they were coming on comrade, comrade. And we were shooting comrade back, and they were walking into us. And we were we finished up. I think we killed just over a thousand. Now bear in mind that we were very inferior numbers, but we had the assets. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, and we made use of those assets. So we we came out to. Uh, the next day, and we're going away. Get, let's get in the pub. Get the war stories going. The kit on the back. Yeah, this is going to be great. You know, you know. And, uh, I don't want to talk about it to the wives. You know the, yeah. the bullshit you normally get. <laughs> and uh, this is this way, guys. They, they put us in a fucking cage. <laughs> they said you'd jump again and say that was a th Saturday morning. So we, we this. It was another camp called Tembu, which is right in the in the Mozambique, and right, it was near 
the Malawian border. So the same drill again, same type of briefing, very motivated. We jumped in there and uh, it was it was good scrapping, you know. And uh, it was, you know, we're in the era of body counts, you know. Uh, we killed about 600. And again, the thing was so well organised, so well planned. That we, we knew we would win before we went. Can you see it? We, yeah. We, we, we trained for this. You know, I mean, these guys were, as I often say, they weren't the Waffen SS. Uh, these guys were good at shooting communist slogans and whatnot and singing freedom songs and whatnot. But uh, fighting, they, they, they had a limit. Some of them could, but not all of them. So the... Um, we did that job and uh, came back and we did numerous other insertions in the south. We did one job, jump where they dropped us too high. It's a place called Mar Mororo and the camp was in a dip and there was a mountain either side of it. So we couldn't fly in at a normal height which for us was about four, maybe 4,500 feet. We had to jump at 1,100 feet and you know because we, we couldn't get down to it. Yeah. And uh, we could see all the all the, the gooks running under us. And we landed and we started sweeping towards what we thought was the camp or where the camp was. So we had one or two contacts. And I was moving along this guy. He jumped up in front of me and he went to take off. And I did it instinctively. I mean, I mean it wasn't as if I, I just went boom. And I hit him on the back of the neck. And for some unknown reason, it just spun up and his brains came and landed on my shirt. And the smell of it, you know, I'd wiped him off. The smell of it, I could smell myself until the end of the op, it was hum yeah. humming. And uh, we, we just got from there and uh, I had a look at it. And it, by this time I got offered a job with the Salute Scout Special Branch, just working for them. Uh, we did a little job down in Malawi where uh, we we went through Malawi. It was for, there was a thing called Exchange or Pair where the region, region did jobs for South Africa and, and vice versa. So we were doing this job for the South Africans. So we, we land there, they drove us up to the border and we had a source with us who, who was taking us to the house that had to be done. We are going to teach these guys a lesson. You know, nobody messes with us. So we then cut the fence from uh, from South Africa into Malawi. We walked down the in, inside Malawi. My mistake, sorry. Uh, Swaziland, got that wrong. Uh, we turned left, cut the fence, dump, you know, holding it, putting wire in, wiring up as we crawled through. Everything was done properly because we'd trained for about two weeks on this. Went up to the house and uh, I was this guy giving the, the okay. So we had these things called bunker bombs and what we, the Rhodesians had devised them and it was just plastic explosions crammed inside a grenade canister with a, a detonator from a, a hand grenade in it and you bent the spoon so it came out further. So you had like a can of beans with explosive inside it and you had the mechanism for a hand grenade. So I blew the whistle for the thing to kick off. One of the guys threw it. We, we, we hit, hit about four windows at the same time. One of the guys threw one, it bounced, it bounced off. There was wired mesh there, you know, a mosquito net. Yeah, yeah. It bounced off and it blew me about four or five feet in the air. Okay. And lucky, my, now my job after that was to run into the house, put a, a parcel of explosives and centre to bring it right down, you know. And uh, I couldn't hear a thing. I just ran in and done it. So we took off. And the next thing, woof. And this house went up. I mean, there was 30 pounds of explosive in it. And all the tiles were all floating down, you know. And we, we weren't out of range and were lying on the ground like that. And uh, we, um, we took off. And you know how you're so clinical on the way in, clip. 
get the yeah. wheel. He just walked up the front. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Messi on the wheel. Aye. <laughs> so we told the South Africans, yeah. the guys who were helping us, to get us water because we'd blackened up totally and we were wearing enemy uniforms. Anyway, we got there, they said, oh, no, no, we will brought you some beer. You guys like you deserve a good drink. There was no water to wash ourselves. They, they, they never clicked. So we're sitting there drinking this beer because we've been running sort of most of the night. And a couple of pints of beer, but all smashed our minds, you know. And uh, they eventually stopped at a stream. And we just walked in the stream and, and washed ourselves as best we could. And uh, it was funny because we walked into a hotel we were living in. And the guy says, where have you been? Oh, we've been visiting coal mines, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he just he just looked at it and shook his head. Um, and then it came to the end in, in Rhodesia, you know. That's from, um, that's, that's from, honest to God, it's like, yeah. just a, a career. It's just like, it's, it's crazy. Um, so you, what happened with the Cali cartel? I, I read about um, the Colombian Pablo Escobar. That's a yeah. big thing on your yeah, well, documentary. We, um. I got posted with a guy called Dave Tompkins who had met in Angola. I I went to see him. He got blown up in Angola. I went to see him in the hospital. Yeah. And uh, we got there and uh, we were all sitting. Everyone here was broke. We were sitting in the booth hall in Hereford. We were all sitting nursing pints in there. And Dave came in. He was always well-dressed, Dave. Yeah. And uh, came in and he said, Peter, he said, I've got a job. I says, what is it? He says, killing Pablo Escobar. I went terrific. And it was all the guys who I would have taken anyway with me sitting in the pub. So we got together and then became top secret, you know. So we move into a corner, <laughs> talking, you no know, hand over the... And the next thing, Dave pulled out a lot of cash and started giving the guys up front money. And the whole demeanour of everybody changed. It turned into a piss up, you know. Yeah. Um, I then flew out to uh, Cali with Dave. We met these guys, businessmen, who were the Cali cartel. Yeah. Um, they asked if I, or if we could kill uh, Pablo Escobar. And I said, yes. Now, Dave always handled the money side of things, and he was good at it. Very fair, very honest. Loads of integrity with Dave. Um, he then says, right, we can do the job if you give us what we want, but it's going to cost you. And he says, tell us what you want, you'll get it. Helicopters, done. Um, grenade launchers, done. M16 rifles, hit, hit, done. Um, you know, and a medical kit, done. And as I said, I, I, I did an interview once. It was like fucking Christmas. Mm. Everything we asked for, we got it. So I went back and collected the guys who I knew. And uh, they came out to Colombia. And we started, pardon me, we started training. And it was... It was a bit boring in the beginning because it took us to a place called Pennsylvania, which was in the hills up at the back of Cali. And it was a big ranch it was there. It was all pristine. It just didn't feel right. But it got the basic drills together for what we were going to do, the formations we were going to use. And, you know, we we got tape and we taped out the Pablo Escobar's house, you know, on the ground with tape so we knew what was where. Yeah. We knew the landing point. Um, and Dave Dave got got the bosses in and he said listen it's, you know we, we need somewhere in the bush to train to get it right so they took us down to a place down on the coast and uh, we um, trained there for 11 weeks well the whole training took 11 weeks and we had everything everything we asked for we got you know, the, we had enough ammunition there to kill 3,000 men. There's 12 of us. Mm. And you know, when you get these experts, you know, sitting on the keyboard going, they would have got slaughtered. But, you, you know, they didn't realise what we were capable of doing because we'd, fight, we'd been fighting against the odds in Africa the whole time. 
we were used to this type of thing. Yeah, the underdogs. Aye. So anyway, we trained and trained, and I could see the men, that you could see the confidence coming into them. You know, they were so sure of themselves. Okay, I can't make it. You're in charge. Tell me what we do next. Okay, he goes down. How do you replace him? You're in red one, you know, and I colour-coded all the houses in, in, in his compound. Uh, you're in red one. What's next so-and-so? What about women and children? Leave them alone. Uh, we're after the males, you know. What about the bodyguards? They get it. Uh, we also had a gunship. Um, I think it was, from what experience I had, and I could only pull on that, um, I think we were well suited for the job. Yeah. So we were sitting there, and then the next thing, Dave Tompkins went, he says, we had to go, because they'd planted a spy inside public's headquarters. And he got, he got to the phone. Now, Pablo had, he was, he was very, very organised. All the guys on the radar in the various parts of the country were on his payroll. So if there was a, a dodgy looking aircraft coming up, they would uh, report it to him. In every corner of every road around Pablo Escobar's area, there was a little shop there selling cigarettes and pop. But there was no population. And it was, they'd had radios, they'd radio in. There's a car coming down, we've not seen it before. So he, re, he was really organised with his security. Yeah. So that's why we chose to get in by helicopter. So we took off, and I sat in the helicopter. And I was thinking, have I given these guys a good deal? Have they, have they been trained well enough? And mm. I, I became happy with it. There was a, a, a terrible sense of peace because... I knew that everything that could possibly be done had been done, except for one thing. So we started flying towards the Andes, and I noticed the, the, the second helicopter went right up. It went really high. It was probably 4,000 feet above us. And we had a young pilot called Tiger, and he was, seemed, he was skirting the trees all the time. And then in the Andes, you get what they call sucker holes, as the cloud comes down on the actual mountainside and then the sun shines from behind it and you get an optical illusion that there's a, a re-entrant there that you can go through. <laughs> and he drove into it and lucky enough, we were in the cloud and I, I un, undone my seatbelt, I turned around and I said to um, I said to the guys, get yourself in the crash position. I just sensed something was going wrong. As I turned back around again, the helicopter turned over and the blades came through the, the cab and they just missed me and hit the pilot because I was in the front seat with the pilot. And we were on the ground, or we, on the trees, bouncing through the trees upside down. Yeah. We eventually cut through, or the helicopter eventually cut through. It bored the hole probably about this much in the ground. And the pilot was lying there, oh, he, was, he was in agony. And we, we all seemed to be okay because they were in the crash position at the back. So I says, Dave, come down. And Dave, Dave and I were trying to get the morphine into him. And, you know, his, his veins had all collapsed. And, uh, you know, I looked at Dave and he, we just couldn't get a vein. And he, he was just going blue. And we just shot him up with morphine. The only thing we did for him was make his death less painful. Um, so I... I managed to get out of the hole and then all of a sudden I suddenly realised I was so excited trying to save the pilot I didn't know what was wrong with myself so I climbed onto the top of where the hole was and I just collapsed and I, I just I said stick a drip in me you know and they couldn't get a, they couldn't get a vein they were smacking and smacking so just an old Rhodesian trick I just cut it off and drank the drip and Dave and the other two guys pulled me onto a ledge and they got the medical kit, they opened up my jacket and padded me up because it was cold up there. I was 9,000 feet up. And I said, get some help. And I suddenly realised I'd broken one of the rules of the combat survival. I never asked anybody to stay with me. So I was on my own. So they, I did an interdynamics, you know, submachine gun. And I lay there, <laughs> it was 
the pain was excruciating. I found a can of beans and I, you know, I managed to open it and eat some. I was just trying to keep myself going. And the next day it rained all day and I was just lying, there was nothing I could do about it. I was feeling a bit sorry for myself at the same time. <laughs> um, because the pain was terrible. And the, the next thing, I think it was on the third day, I heard some guys come in and they were speaking in Spanish. I went, oh, I'm going to get it, you know. And uh, so I took a, a grenade and I pulled the pin out and I had the interdynamic. Now, please, this wasn't the heroism. Yeah. It was I knew if these guys got me, I was going to die a terrible death. So I had them there like that, but I didn't know who they were. Yeah. So one guy came up to me and I just stuck the submachine in his stomach. And he went, amigo, 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 you know. And I went, oh. And it was mountain men who'd come to save me. So they, they really got to work on it. I put the pin back into the grenade. And they just, they were bum, bum, they chopped, chopped down a tree, no bother. And the tree it was about like a telegraph pole. They cleaned it all off and it was just clean as a telegraph pole when they finished. He says, we're going to get you out. I said, how long will it take? He says, eight hours. Right. So we, uh, <laughs> they lowered me down in this. They put, as we came to a dip or a re entrant, they'd lower this big pole down. By this time, the tree had become a pole, as in telegraph pole. Yeah. So they're sliding me down a telegraph pole on the end of this rope. And the pain. Anyway, we, we went, we were going all day. We got to the bottom, and, uh, and I was, we camped up for the night in a little sort of trench at the side of a river and it started raining again and we're just wet all night and I says these guys have really done me a favour and I could hear, sort of hear the Colombian um, one for you one for me and one for you and two for him you know they were, they'd robbed me of the escape money I had and they were yeah. split that up <laughs> <laughs> and I just said to myself well what's a life worth so we carried on the next day, same thing, down again, down again. Um, and we eventually got to this little hut and they threw me onto a, a bed that was made out of Hessian. You know the old bag, bags, Hessian bags? Yeah. And I lay there, I just went, bump, I was out. Then they come in and said, the helicopter's coming, the helicopter's coming. I says, and I'm expecting it to be British still, come right into the side of the hut and I step onto it. I says, where's it landing? This is the top of that hill. So I had to climb another hill and I've got a stick there. And I'm pushing myself up. And I got to the hill and the helicopter came in. I lost my balance and it blew me back down the hill again. <laughs> and very, very fortunately, I had, uh, I was exhausted. So I couldn't resist it and I just let it happen. I went back up again and they got me and put me in hospital and the surgeons went to work on me. Uh, I'd caved in ribs a whole lot. Um, I thought at one stage I'd stove chest, which you could die with, but it didn't appear that way. Um, and after and the third day, they said, we've got to get you out of here. I says, what is it? The bodies have got an idea that you're here. So I get shipped out and I went back to Cali. And... Uh, the guys really looked after me. I was lying in bed there and I was just totally blue with bruises, you know. Um, so they said, okay, we're going to have another go. And then they had to rethink about it because they were, the police were all over the place. So they yeah. said, we'll ship you up to Panama. They shipped us up to Panama. We spent about three or four weeks up there. And they said, it's not going to happen. There's too much trouble at the moment. So we all came back to the UK, and that was the Pablo thing finished. Did you, like you said, you mentioned you got to speak to him at one point? Yeah, there was a couple of things happened, and they were really funny, because we'd been in Colombia before, you know, yeah. and we'd trained some guys, and uh, this guy came along, and it was like a sort of looking at what I was doing, and we were doing a jungle lane where guys were shooting, and uh, I met him. And I noticed that he did high, really high tech kit. 
you know, satellite telephone call, uh, yeah. phones and that. They weren't around <laughs> at the time, you know. Yeah. All um, the counts. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went, this is too much. I noticed they were all tooled up extremely well. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys I was liaising with, there was army guys with us the whole time. He says, he wants to have a chat with you after this. So they took me there and I chatted away. And uh, he was, I found him just a normal guy. Uh, but you could see he was the boss. Just his presence yeah. alone, you, you could feel it. You could up. sense that, yeah. you know, there was and some he, some strength behind him. Yeah, and uh, I met him. I met him there, and uh, I found him to be a. He'd done an awful lot of stuff for the people of Medellin, but if you stepped in his road, he was quite capable of killing you. You know. Yeah. Definitely. But. Uh, at one stage, these guys I was training, he sent us down to the S. Esquibo River, right down in the bottom of Colombia, and we're training these guys. And uh, the food there was atrocious. You know, <laughs> we'd a cook there, and we nicknamed a typhoid Mary. And it, honestly, you go like that, and you know, you become so starving, you just eat it and swallow it. Yeah, you, I don't you, know, you don't yeah. want the taste of it or the aroma. <laughs> and we said, right. She she this big cockerel was about this size and one of the guys went, I'm having that bump off of the head and they cooked it for the cell, you know. And she was very she wouldn't talk to us. No. <laughs> so the food in turn gets worse, you know. So they said I said, Can you get us some meat? Can you get us some meat from somewhere? So the next thing a boat comes up the river and it's got a cow tied on it and the, you know the all the, the only thing that was out of the water was the head. So they pull in and they they we've got your um a cow. Get a cow. And the next thing, the argument starts. Everyone's an expert. I'll kill it. So they get a, a branch of trees, you know, the, the, the bushes, they put its head in, 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 in the middle of the branch. And it's there like that, and it's looking them. And this poor thing's wondering, what's going to happen to me here? And they're all arguing who's going to shoot it, you know. So they, they, they shoot the thing, and they just they stayed there for about two minutes, went, Meow. and it just, just <laughs> dropped dead. <laughs> So then they all become butchers. There's knives flying all over yeah. the place. They're cutting this animal up, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't like a sirloin steak. It was just chunks of flesh. Yeah. <laughs> so at least they, we got that and we ate it right away. It was the freshest food we had down there. Um, there was some good times there, you know. In the, I can in imagine. The guys. What was um, so? What was life like back in the UK? So you've. I read you say, you, you know, you became a landlord. And... I had, well, I had a pub at the time. And the next thing is, uh, I'm in the pub. And one of the barmaids said, hey, hey, Peter, there's some toffs down the stair I want to see you. And I got down there, it was like some sort of John Le Carre movie, you know. Yeah. One's got the sort of melting overcoat. He didn't have the fleur in the, repel, uh, the lapels. Yeah. But the other one was sort of deeply tanned, the operating type, you know. We'd like to have a word with you. I said, yeah, interesting. Um, is there any way we can be private? So I took him upstairs. Do you want a drink? You know, I'll have Perry water, you know. And I was sitting there and he said, do you know that you were going to be shot down on the way back from the Escobar job? I said, we had an idea, yes. But what I didn't tell him, is do you think you're that thick that we never thought about that? Um, because Dave was very, very organised. Mm. And the idea was to get a boat in place. We wouldn't go back. We'd go to the boat, tip the helicopters off, off side, and go to Panama in the boat. And uh, but he, we never get credit for thinking that. Yes, you were going to be eliminated. Mark my words, if I was you, I wouldn't go back there. And I looked at this guy, and behind him was a photograph of my grandfather, who fought from the beginning to the end in the First World War, got, got himself wounded three times, and I'm looking at this thing in front of me, mm. you know, talking, you know, lecturing. He, he, I think he was. I think there was a bit of role playing going on there as well, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they left, and I, I never heard any more about it. Brilliant. That's it. So what's um so what's your life like now, seeing as 
This is Peter's book, by the way. No Mean Soldier. This has been out since the yeah. 90s, hasn't it? Yeah, it was rewritten. It's uh, rewritten. Yeah. Look forward to that. So you can get yeah. Where can you get this book? Well, yeah. Amazon. I've seen it on Amazon. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it off the website. You can get it on the website. Oh, so yeah. I'll, I'll be putting all your descriptions in yeah. within the. Um, so anyone who wants to get a book, yeah, I'll put a, I'll put all the websites yeah. within the description to get Peter's book, right. which is a great read, by the way. You asked me a question there. You said, "How's life now?" How's life now? I can identify with you in a lot of ways. And I look at the earlier part of my life. Yeah. The being RTU'd, fighting with people, getting drunk, getting locked up. And I look at it, and you know some if I hadn't have been there, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I, I have a fantastic life now. I'm extremely contented. It's fantastic. That's the only way I can put it. Brilliant. That's that's a brilliant way to finish off a great podcast. I have yeah. absolutely been thrilled with the stories, and it's like I'm pretty sure there's tons more, but I don't want to spoil it for everyone yeah. because there's a documentary also called Killing Escobar, which is, is that on Netflix? BBC iPlayer. BBC iPlayer. <laughs> so we'll be watching that again tonight. Um, P- Peter, right? I always say this at the end of every podcast. Yeah. Right, is there any pearls of wisdom, anything you'd say to a young Peter MacLeish coming through the doors of life? And if you had the opportunity to say something, what would you say? I'd say something that you said. My biggest enemy was a guy called Peter MacLeish. Yeah. <laughs> True story. Yeah. True story. I like that. And with that, Peter, it's been a pleasure to, to, to listen to you. Thanks for coming on, mate.